All right, we are recording. Um, I'm now gonna read our land acknowledgement. The South Berwick Library is located on Endikina, which is the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and the human beings who have stewarded Endikina throughout the generations, affirming that there are native people in Maine and the wider Wabanaki homeland today, and that their story has continued for more than 12,000 years. And I will now turn it over to Alan Emioko. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Thanks for that um, uh, landing. Um, so uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for sitting in on this talk about why native plants are important for your pollinator garden. Uh, the talk will also explore how that importance extends to the local ecosystem and beyond as well. <clears throat> My name is Alan Amioka. I'm a South Berwick resident, uh, UMaine Extension Master Gardener Volunteer of York County. Uh, where one of the projects I can be found at is at the uh, All Seasons Garden work and Workshops that I coordinate at Wells Reserve at Laudholm. I also volunteer on several native plant projects, among them the, the Native Plant Border and Pollinate New England Gardens, also at Wells Reserve, and also here now at the uh, In Progress South Berwick Library <clears throat> Native Plant Garden. I'm joined tonight by Lori Bowen, um, UMaine Extension Food Systems Program Associate, and she's also the coordinator of the statewide uh, Pollinator Friendly Garden Certification Program. I, along with about 11 uh, other fellow Master Gardener volunteers and extension staff uh, from around Maine and, New and now New Hampshire, are on the committee that reviews applications for gardens looking to be certified pollinator friendly. Um, we ask that you can either, we're gonna ask you to hold your question to the end, or if you want to put them into the chat box, Lori will be monitoring that and providing links to information as we go along. And uh, the rest of the questions will be taken at the end. So <clears throat> you may recognize this path and stand of trees that's at Vaughnwood State Park, uh, right around the corner. And the land that became Vaughnwood State Park is a beautiful forest of old growth, native Eastern hemlock and deciduous trees. Um, in 1898, when Emily Tyson purchased it, it was just coming out of being fields that were farmed around uh, 1800. So the uh, 125 years of uh, growth have produced a, a marvelous, peaceful space where dappled sun filters through the canopy uh, that quietly partners with the sights, sounds, and history of the Salmon Falls River. It's really quite a gem, and I've had people tell me that when I've been in that uh, the park. So those um, eastern hemlock, sugar canadensis, uh, trees can live to be 900 years old, taking 250 to 300 years to reach maturity. And they provide uh, shelter and cover for multiple species. Uh, that it's so close to home, this special place right here in our backyard has a wonderful resonance. And speaking of backyards, we have this acronym. It's often, often was used in the 60s to protest locating nuclear plants and toxic waste dumps and such anywhere close to home. Um, and that stood for not in my backyard. And with events like Three Mile Island, Chernobyl and Superfund cleanups in Fukushima and Japan uh, and so on, it was a good example of being safe rather than sorry. <clears> Though <throat> so the ensuing 60 years, it started becoming clearer to more that through the natural processes of water cycling and runoff uh, winds, the jet stream, ocean currents and more, material in one place could wind up elsewhere. Um, so it was more like your yard is my backyard too. Um, it's especially applicable, uh, as, as many know, uh, with invasive species. It um, creates this sort of acronym, which is a mouthful, like sounds like somebody's in pain. So maybe we can just remember it as your yard is my yard and try to think about um, where things are going and what the effects might be. So that brings us to um, main yardscaping. So, <clears throat> so this will be a three minute tour to provide an overview of a related and relevant one and a half hour program <clears throat> done by Master Garden volunteers as well. Um, so main yardscaping began in the early 2000s, growing out of Castle, Casco Bayscaping, uh, which was started in response to seeing algal blooms along the mudflats of Casco Bay. And that was later identified as um, the effects of over and improper use of lawn garden maintenance chemicals and practices. And the ensuing program was developed uh, to show how to create and maintain home environments that are ecologically neutral or beneficial, and they're beautiful as well. So the main yardscaping mission was to inspire Mainers to create and maintain healthy landscapes through ecologically based practices that minimize reliance on water, fertilizer, uh, pesticides, and labor. 
Uh, there are main yardscaping is built off of five steps. Uh, build healthy soil, it's the basis for organic gardening. You feed the soil, not the plant. Uh, you practice low input lawn care. Um, properly established, uh, especially native plants, require little to no additional feeding. Uh, practice smart watering, there are many ways to do this. Um, and the program goes into it in much more detail, but drip irrigation is one. You don't wanna water the weeds, uh, time of day is important and so on. Uh, very important point is to um, think twice before using pesticides. Uh, too often pesticides are indiscriminate and they'll kill off the beneficial insects of which there are many, many um, uh, while you're trying to get rid of the, the ones you don't want. And then the, the last point, uh, which is very, very relevant to what we're talking about tonight is the right plant for the site. So within that point, um, there are four points to consider. One is to assess your conditions, uh, determine whether or not it's dry or wet or it's average soil, and whether it's sandy or clay or loam and so on and so forth, as well as determining uh, how much sun you have. Full sun is considered six hours or more, and uh, uh, part is four hours and shade is anything less than that. So the next thing is to consider what you want your lawn or your garden for and how much you'll use it. Um, you're gonna, you can use it for a soccer practice field or perhaps a vegetable garden. Um, or if you just wanna commune with nature to borrow another term from the 60s and sit there in, amongst your garden and while a hummingbird buzzes in and um, doesn't even notice you're there, um, all of those require uh, different amounts of input and it's, um, uh, there are other ways of using your space, your land, uh, your, uh, your area in an ecologically productive way that can be personally satisfying and enriching. <clears throat> and they all require uh, different sorts of input. <clears throat> uh, the next point is to incorporate layers. Um, this is more than a visual or aesthetic consideration, which is what prior generations of horticultural design what we're focused on um, was <clears throat> we've got some uh, rows of swamp milkweed here, and this is a, a mountain mint, a broadleaf mountain mint, a little bit higher, a little bit further back, and above that is Joe pie weed, and then behind that is um, green headed coneflower. And uh, that's to give various um, uh, insects different places to land, and, and this, this also extends to uh, having trees. There is, there's a cherry tree in the background there. And then the last point is native plants are easier to maintain and they're better for wildlife and biodiversity. <clears throat> and uh, this is um, my property here in South Berwick. When I first moved here, there were virtually no trees. And uh, this is a tree that has just introduced itself basically. Um, this is a Viburnum lentago and nanny berry. It's, it's one you can buy, but I didn't have to do that. And it just grew itself, it's a native plant. <clears throat> Another is uh, hawthorn, you might be familiar with that. It's the one with the spikes on it, but it has uh, nice berries for the fall and it's uh, good for wildlife. And that also just introduced itself, uh, another native plant. And along that, that line are uh, cherry trees and um, other native plants. There are also uh, invasive plants and we'll talk a little bit more about them later on, but that kind of comes with the package these days. <clears throat> So a little bit about my journey of learning about native plants and just to share with you some folks that you can get some uh, more terrific information about. So I'm learning that getting into native plants is really a euphemism for being a supporter of local ecosystems, uh, which is in turn a supporter of all the ecosystems that make up life on earth, since they are very much connected, uh, really. And um, they provide so many examples of um, uh, what goes around comes around. So just as yardscaping was breaking ground for a new paradigm away from the, the highly marketed, coveted, uh, manicured lawns and visually unique introduced or cultivated plants, ecological garden and landscape design is a call for letting the functional beauty and aspects of plants uh, that evolve to work and support an ecosystem uh, show their stuff. Uh, it's a kind of gardening that embraces a beauty that goes beyond the, um, just the way they look. It's something that matters uh, now more than ever. So the three shown here, um, Professor Doug Tallamy's author of numerous books, um, Bringing Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope and the Nature of Oaks most recently, uh, and his talks, he, which he generous, generously records and allows people to, to see is very, very entertaining. Um, he's based out of Delaware, uh, lives in Pennsylvania. 
Um, uh, Dr. Annie White is a speaker, researcher, and ecological landscape designer uh, based in Vermont. And uh, Heather McCargo is the founder of Wild Sea Project um, uh, that's headquartered now up in Falmouth. Um, it used to be Portland, and she actually used to live in South Berwick. Um, them, and along with extension educators, professors, other Master Garden volunteers, and other enthusiasts and citizen scientists, um, all kind of contributed to uh, what started my interest in this and uh, everything it's built on their work. And I thank them for that, and I thank you for your interest. So what is the native plant? It's uh, one that's considered to have been here prior to Europeans coming to North America, so uh, about 500 plus years ago. Um, here's one, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're seeing more of. It's uh, Asclepius uh, incarnata, uh, rose or swamp milkweed. It's not as common as uh, Asclepius uh, syriaca, the common milkweed. Uh, it's a nice difference in color. It's still very much a, a monarch host plant, uh, meaning monarchs need this uh, genus in order to survive. Another lovely native is uh, the sundial lupin, Lupinus perennis, or it's also called a wild lupin. It's the legume, it's in the pea family, it fixes nitrogen and it grows in sandy pine barrens. Um, <clears throat> and I've got some growing all over my yard and around the, the, the gravel that's near my foundation. So it's uh, able to, to grow in a lot of different places. Uh, and this plant is a sole host plant for the carna blue butterfly. Unfortunately, it has been ex extirpated in Maine, Massachusetts, uh, Pennsylvania, Iowa, and Illinois. Um, there's a wild population in New Hampshire, and it is gro it's grown in gardens around Maine. It's easy and it's fun to grow. Um, it's fun to watch if anybody's familiar with lupins, but specifically um, uh, it, uh, sundial lupin. The seeds pop when the, the seeds are ready and then they fly off, and you gotta be careful not to be too close because you get popped in the eye, but it's a neat way that it dis disperses its seeds. And several years ago, I spoke with someone from New York where uh, they'd been working on restoring um, the carna blue butterfly and sundial lupin habitat, and they've seen its return. So maybe we'll see the return of the, the beautiful carna blue, which is native to Maine. Uh, currently, it's being displaced by a non-native and some consider invasive, uh, another uh, type of lupin called the big leaf lupin or lupinus polyphyllus. So um, why native plants? Um, Follow, these are the points that are going to be covered in this presentation. And it's, it's all surrounded by, uh, also about the, uh, they're made for the task because they're adapted to the eco region. Uh, they have and support beneficial relationships. They support um, uh, biodiversity. Uh, native species rely on other native species. Uh, they provide a sense of place and a sense of beauty. So we'll start by taking a look at ecoregions and we'll touch on all the points noted and then we'll address uh, non-natives a bit later. So this is a map of the level three ecoregion. As you can see, um, ecoregions are not defined by state boundaries. Um, Maine's a wonderfully diverse state which has three regions uh, which overlap into surrounding states and uh, New Hampshire has two um, parts of which are shared with Maine. And then they also go into New York and Massachusetts and so on. And this was developed uh, in the late 80s uh, by the EPA. It was done to create a framework from which recommendations could be made to manage environmental resources. Um, uh, what to plant and why was, was one of them. And from the EPA website, ecoregions uh, denote areas of similarity in the mosaic of biotic, abiotic, terrestrial, and aquatic ecosystem components with human beings considered as part of the biota. Um, <clears throat> within any given ecoregion, um, that vast number of species, the plants and the animals, co-evolved over millennia, um, developing, adjusting mutually dependent give and take uh, interactions. Those in interdependent relationships created a dynamically balanced system, uh, an equilibrium uh, where they're very stable in the long run, they change very slowly, to ensure continuance of species where changes are typically appear, appear um, gradually over a long period of time and adjustments are made possible by the diversity of all those species. Removal of parts of one um, in too, period of short, too short a period of time can lead to a, a collapse of that system. So pulling back to view the whole of the environment, uh, one can see it's comprised of many interconnected ecosystems that in addition to being places um, that are sources of food, fuel, medicine, carbon sequestration, clean air and water, they're intricately intertwined. 
and long before the internet, um, this was and is a World Wide Web. So another luminary in, in this area is uh, E.O. Wilson. And one of his many quotes is, insects run the world. And here you can see two caterpillars. Um, one is a, an American lady on the right and a monarch on the, the lower left. Uh, E.O. Wilson was um, a biologist, a theorist, a uh, naturalist and author who's considered the father of biodiversity. And um, he discovered his research showed that insects are one of the essential players in ecosystems. They are um, the best at converting the energy uh, of plants into animal protein so that they in turn are food for animals higher up the food chain. They also provide critical ecosystem services with pollination being the most widely known, but they also uh, do things like they cycle organic matter that's, uh, that's died and uh, they turn it into nutrients that uh, they, can, they and others can use. So uh, there really is not a real thing such as waste, it's just being used differently. And these are the butterflies that grow from them. This uh, painted lady looks a little like a monarch, same colors, smaller and different patterns. And then the familiar monarch and this monarch here is actually shown on um, uh, swamp milkweed, I mean, um, common milkweed, the uh, Slipius uh, syriaca. <clears throat> he uh, recently passed away and he, uh, before, uh, he has a, published a book called Half Earth, where he laid out the science indicating that half of the Earth's um, natural systems need to remain functioning if the other half is to survive. And uh, Professor Tallamy Riley notes that since one half is occupied by us and the other uh, terrestrial half is in agriculture, and since we don't have a third half, we need to do something. And he'll, he says that that something begins with how we garden and uh, treat the earth <clears throat> we need to live on. So what does it have to do with pollinators? Um, no species is an island, as we've already started talking about, and no pollinator is an island. It has needs for food among them and supplies the need of pollination to its sources of food. And um, other relationships are that song and other birds uh, rely on other native species and native birds uh, need and they largely prefer native insects. Um, and native insects, again, they need and largely prefer native plants. So food, um, plants are the base of the food chain and we need to eat plants or the animals that eat them in order to live. And pollinators are responsible for pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. 35% um, <clears throat> of the world's food crops depend on animal pollinators for their continued survival. Without insects, those plants would struggle if they're even able to survive. <clears throat> um, it should be noted that um, over 100 crops depend on pollinators to provide the variety of foods we eat, and pollinators are responsible for nearly $15 billion worth of food per the USDA. Um, also, that there are many food crops that aren't pollinated by native insects. Um, for instance, wheat, corn, and rice are wind pollinated. But the 35% shown indicates that one out of three bites of the richest of the foods we eat do need pollinators. <clears throat> and our native pollinators are in decline. Uh, due to habitat loss, invasive plants that degrade habitat quality and thus diversity. And climate and pesticides are also factors affecting pollinator populations. Native pollinator insects can more than help fill a general, general pollinator gap if they have the food and the plants that they need. So <clears throat> while we're talking about food, we can also talk about food deserts. Uh, you may have seen the bumper sticker that says, uh, no farms, no food. And that's pretty clear. But it could also easily say, if you don't have enough native plants, you won't have enough caterpillars, and you'll have fewer or no breeding birds. And uh, Professor Tallamy uh, did a study, several studies bearing this out. Now, uh, one is named Non-Native Plants Reduce Population Growth of an Insectivorous Bird. And uh, he and his team researched uh, an area around uh, Washington, D.C. over three breeding seasons, and they studied uh, over 100 nests and looked at uh, 13 years past records. And the team found that there's more food on native plants. Uh, they counted the number of insects on them. Uh, they also found that uh, crepe myrtle, which is a popular um, plant in the study area had virtually no caterpillars. So they weren't supporting uh, any of the birds. Um, the foraging range is larger than a football field. It's more than an acre. Uh, the uh, Carolina chickadee study uh, was had a 50, me 50 meter radius or a 330 foot um, circle. And he 
concluded that each plant in your landscape should be thought of as a bird feeder. So most young birds need lots of insects to fuel their rapid growth and caterpillars are preferred. These interdependent roles and relationships are woven into and create the fabric of what to keep the ecosystems going. Your pollinator friendly garden needs to and can supply enough of the right kinds of plant materials to support the local wildlife and thus the ecosystem and us. Um, chickadees need 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars or the nutritional equivalent within 50 meters of its nest or its chicks will starve. And the closer the food source means there are fewer trips and less energy expended to get it and you'll be better off. Uh, birds will eat many insects, as you saw in the earlier image of the bluebirds with both caterpillars and grasshopper in, in their beaks. Uh, but caterpillars are the superfoods. They're abundant with the right plants, uh, right plants around, and um, they have a nice feature of being easier to digest, um, softer than uh, insects with hard shells. So you can see that the birds need a high output source of caterpillars and insects, and uh, they need food factories within their, within their foraging range. Um, <clears throat> plants, grasses, shrubs, flowering, uh, herbs, forbs, and trees are those factories, and trees are actually mega factories. Um, since native plants uh, and trees vary, it's important to include major food sources, and these would be the, the keystone species, uh, the mega factories. 7% um, of our local species support 75% of the native insects uh, because they have uh, much more biomass. Um, and not all species offer the same benefit to wildlife. Uh, trees naturally have the most biomass. And there is a way you can see which um, trees and plants are, are best for your area. Um, the top species for South Berwick are um, for trees and shrubs. Willow uh, supports 434 uh, different um, uh, lepidopterans. And oak is 431, very, very close, followed by birches and cherries and beech plum, uh, aspens and poplars. <clears throat> and as far as flowers and grasses go, the top three are goldenrod, which supports 121, uh, wild strawberry supports 81, and sunflower 60. And you can find that information at the Native Plant Finder at the National Wildlife Federation. And um, so this is a database that's based on the work of Doug, Douglas Tallamy, and if you go to the website, you can uh, plug in um, your zip code, whether it's 03908 or elsewhere, and uh, you'll get you'll see a listing of uh, the, the, the top uh, providers or the top plants that the uh, insects will, will eat. The um, Native Plant Trust also has one that's uh, based on this data, and that's also very good. So this is um, a graphic put together by the Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Group um, risk. And uh, one of the many reasons conservation-minded organizations advocate planting for pollinators and by extension the animals that depend upon them is the place they need to live has been diminishing due to habitat loss and fragmentation. Creating numerous spaces or oases that can be accessed by them can begin to stitch together, stitch together um, what Doug, Douglas Tallamy has dubbed homegrown national park. Uh, that habitat loss and fragmentation can lead to reductions in species populations and ultimately lead, lead to extinctions. And those extinctions and even reductions then affect species diversity. That critical diversity of uh, the vast selection pool that gives species more options for being resilient and able to adapt to forces such as pests and disease and climate change. So on the left, you can see that um, an area with non-native plants, there are fewer insects and caterpillars, uh, so the birds and other animals might struggle to get enough food. Get enough food. Um, the, that reduced number of insects would also translate into fewer pollinators uh, that plants need to continue. And then the right illustrates a rich native ecosystem with an abundance of critters. Um, we can see that uh, there's a rich ecosystem is a 50 percent higher abundance of nat native birds and uh, nine times uh, more rare birds and uh, three times as many butterfly species and uh, twice as many native bees. So um, let's talk about some definitions. Um, straight species are the honest to goodness plant that is grown and developed in its natural habitat with no human tinkering. Um, these are grown from seed in the wild, uh, open pollinated naturally in the eco region by wind or critters. <clears throat> they grew to their um, genetic type uh, in a true form and exemplify diversity. 
<clears throat> cultivar refers to a plant that has been artificially selected by people for certain desirable traits. Um, these plants are propagated to keep those desirable traits, often by cloning or asexually, which by definition does not contribute to biodiversity. Uh, the word cultivar is a combination of the words cultivated and variety. Um, and cultivated is the human involvement and variety is the alteration. <clears throat> when looking for plants, you can identify cultivars by an additional name that will be in single quotes. Um, and that's usually intended to elevate the plant's appeal. For instance, um, the plant Euonymus alatus compactus is in quotes, uh, is a name for burning bush, which is, happens to be invasive. Uh, but uh, it hasn't been for a long time. Well, it's, in fact, there's still places that sell it. Um, unfortunately for us, as far as understanding, and that's the confusion, is naturally occurring varieties are named in the same way. So um, you may be wondering, are native ours as beneficial to the ecosystem as native straight species? And Dr. Annie White was um, asked, asked just that question. And among others for her PhD work at the University of Vermont, which was published in 2017. She studied bees, uh, comparing the number of pollinator visits to native ours versus the number of visits to straight single natives, uh, straight species natives. She also measured pollen and uh, nectar amounts. And she studied uh, 12 native species, 14 native cultivars are native ours. And what she found is that some native ours contain sufficient nectar and pollen and were attractive to bees. Um, <clears throat> which is interesting. Uh, the other half were less so, some significantly. Um, <clears throat> some contained no pollen. Uh, these, these are the native ours, little nectar, or were sterile, which is kind of a characteristic of cultivars and native ours. So she found that the more intense the breeding of the native are, the less attractive the plants were to bees. <clears throat> uh, other takeaways from Dr. White's study is that um, a big one is that more research is needed. Um, the results were not entirely against native ours. Um, there were some situations where they could be warranted, um, especially if uh, selection is limited. And it is possible for a cultivar, cultivar to outperform um, the, the straight species. One example was something called uh, lavender towers. It's a, um, a <clears throat> selection of um, culvers root, actually it's a cultivar of uh, culvers root, Veronicastrum virginicum. Um, but once again, more research is needed. The big picture takeaway is um, to play, plant natives where you can. Uh, and if you're looking at native ours, pay attention to the flower forms. It's best to stay away from double flowers or flowers shaped differently than the natives because the altered morphology, the shape of uh, and the interaction, the, the way they developed doesn't work for the pollinators. Also pay attention to altered bloom times and this goes to phenology. Uh, some cultivars bloomed at times that insects weren't able to take advantage of. They just weren't around at the right time. So the other thing is that native ours um, can lead to there being less of what our pollinators have evolved to expect or to need. Um, and then to make things even more complicated, uh, native ours can cross pollinate with a straight species, which can then alter our lo local population. <clears throat> so in general, the best place to start is with the known benefits of native plants from seed. They promote the biodiversity. Um, they promote the way the plants continue to evolve, to work with it, and, it, and they fit into our ecoregions and support other native wildlife. Um, a big challenge to planting native street species is that nursery horticulture is an industry. It's um, directed towards delivering a consistent product, which is what uh, people would want. Um, to, del to deliver it with fewer surprises. It's easier to scale up because they're copying it uh, um, and it's easier to, and cheaper to mass produce, uh, almost, as a, almost as if it was in a factory. Uh, but if they're genetically identical by cloning, no variation, no diversity. Um, we've talked about how that can be detrimental to the ecosystem. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, here are some examples of native plants uh, and native ours uh, displaying primarily varieties of color and uh, one of color and shape. Um, other traits that are developed uh, as far as cultivars are to change the, the height of the bloom, time, disease, and more. And some of those are, are uh, important and necessary characteristics, but it's a little bit of a trade-off. So on the right here is a native Symphiotrichum nova angliae, the uh, New England aster. And um, down below it is a cultivar or a native ar. It's called Alma Pochke, and it's 
essentially shaped um, and bloomed similarly to uh, the native New England aster, aster. But despite the similarity of the morphology, the size of bloom time, <clears throat> the difference being basically the color, the native New England aster had significantly uh, more visits from pollinators than the native are. And um, Another point to note is that cultivars also vary in their longevity. Um, sometimes the modifications render them short-lived um, as well as sometimes sterile. Uh, per Dr. White's notes, uh, the New England asters that I studied showed one of the largest differences that I saw between the native and cultivar Alma uh, as in 20 times more pollinators on the natives than on the cultivars. Uh, that was one that really surprised her because the flowers are very have very similar morphology, the same size, and they were blooming at exactly the same time. They just had that color difference. So <clears throat> over on the left are two butterfly milkweeds. Um, the uh, bees and other pollinators love it, and uh, the, the monarch uh, naturally absolutely needs it to survive. <clears throat> and this is a Schlippius uh, tuberosa. It's a um, orange variation on uh, the milkweed, it's a, a nice uh, color complement. And below it is a naturally occurring um, selection of um, that milkweed. It, it comes in yellow, but it's um, as beneficial because it occurred naturally. Um, the, the, the drawback on this is it's called a selection and it has its name and its catchy name in single um, quotes like this but it's typically cloned if it's going to be sold in a nursery. So it's going to be genetically identical to the one it, it was copied from. So um, if you want the color, that's fine, but make sure you have enough other of uh, the straight species in order to support the population. And then in the middle um, is a cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. And uh, I planted this during the, uh, the pandemic and um, I was rewarded with having a, a lot of uh, hummingbird visits. Um, a great advantage to having a plant like this versus a hummingbird feeder is uh, these the hummingbirds um, will be pollinating the plants, so they'll they'll help it, be helping the ecosystem as opposed to a hummingbird feeder where only the hummingbirds gets a benefit. And down below it is a um, a hybrid between um, the Lobelia cardinalis and a another Lobelia, Lobelia syphilitica, which is a blue Lobelia, and you can see the color is different. Um, the shape is different and it provides very, very little benefit to uh, the insects or the hummingbirds. Okay, so we've talked about native plants a bit, but what about non-native plants? Uh, good, bad, and different. Um, it would be much easier uh, if you could say one way or the other, but um, non-native plants are those that, and animals and insects, are those that arrived in areas in which they did not develop. They're also called exotics or introduced. And the typical way of introduction was deliberate for various reasons. Um, sometimes it was an accidental hitchhike. Uh, it was Europeans bringing a bit of their traditional environment over to the new world. It seemed like an okay idea at the time. And um, thankfully, generally it was okay as there did not seem to be any apparent problems. <clears throat> One such example is um, uh, Lychnus uh, coronaria, rose campion. Uh, it's pretty common around here. And it's uh, originally from Europe and Asia and records in the US go back to Monticello and Jefferson 1700. It's, uh, it's got striking color. It, it does spread pretty readily. It doesn't take much care, um, but there hasn't been much study on the effects uh, of uh, insect visits and I haven't spent time looking at it. Maybe I will sometime. And then as we saw earlier uh, with native referring to the area the plants evolved in, um, and this country being so large and ge geologically diverse, um, there are plants that uh, develop differently depending on where they are. And these are a couple of examples of plants that aren't native, but they aren't bad. Um, the one on the right here is, is a river birch. It's from not too far away, kind of in the Ohio Valley area, but it's sometimes uh, recommended uh, over our native paper birch uh, or gray birch because um, it's less susceptible to uh, the birch borer. And um, <clears throat> it, it looks a little bit different, so it adds some variety. Excuse me. And then uh, to its left are uh, poppies and uh, Baptisia australis. Um, they, those are also both not native, uh, but they are native to the U.S. And they can add uh, variety and color to your garden. 
So another set of plants um, here is, are these native. Uh, all this white in here is Paris uh, uh, Calariana. It's a calorie pear. Uh, that's from the Far East. And it was introduced as a tough rootstock, it's, but it is highly invasive. Um, there's very, very little, if any, support for native insects. Um, uh, Douglas Tallamy has, has researched them and found that there are very few insects on them. And <clears throat> currently the northern area, it, uh, it's the northernmost area that it's in is Pennsylvania. Um, and it is considered very, very invasive. But uh, with things like climate change and habitats moving, moving north generally, uh, it's not out of the question that it, uh, it should be watched. Another one here is uh, Forsythia. Everyone's familiar with that. This again is not native, uh, also from Europe, um, from the Far East, uh, but it's been around so long, um, it's been naturalized. Uh, it's not really invasive, but it does spread very uh, um, aggressively. It can spread very aggressively. Uh, and it's uh, Margaret Roach, uh, Margaret Rankel, I'm sorry, has written a nice piece in the New York Times about um, how some of these plants that have been introduced mostly around the 1800s um, are changing our perception of, 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 of the seasons. Um, so, you might wonder if a lawn is native. Uh, it's not native, uh, it's, for, it's from Europe. It's not invasive, but uh, a lot can be said about them. Uh, they're a time and money drain that has little ecosystem benefit. <clears throat> um, it's become the default landscaping option for large areas, due in all, no small part to um, the Levitt family of Levittown renown and uh, some savvy and relentless marketing. It is close to a monoculture. It takes uh, a lot of work to make it and keep it looking like a carpet uh, from watering to mowing to weeding. <clears throat> uh, there have been several articles about how uh, lawns are, well, to put it uh, bluntly, one person, uh, former director of uh, Native Plant Trust said that our lawns are killing us. And he went on to detail how they are not very helpful to us and that they cost us too much. And there are several other articles that um, uh, indicate that it's really time to move on from the, the prior paradigm. Second, um, per 2005 NASA satellite imaging estimate, there are 40 million acres of lawn in the US. And that's 40 million acres of non-ecologically productive non-native plants. Um, and next, Professor Doug Tallamy writes about his homegrown national park, which was mentioned earlier. And he writes uh, more about it than Nature's Best Hope. He proposes that if we converted half of this nation's lawns into native plants, uh, we could create a collective native wildlife habitat larger than, um, and he goes on to do this very dramatically in his presentations, but larger than um, the area of the Adirondacks, Yellowstone, Yosemite, Grand Tetons, uh, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, uh, North Cascade, Badlands, Olympic, Grand Canyon, Denali, and Great Smoky Mountains. And all of those would be less than 20 million acres. And then there are non-native, which become invasive. Uh, invasives are non-natives that sometimes escape cultivation uh, or their intended use, and they take advantage of differences in the growing conditions and, and causes harm. They don't provide ecosystem services, many insects won't eat their leaves, they don't recognize them as food, they aren't suitable hosts for insects, and they often degrade rather than support and enhance the soils. Uh, they outcompete and displace native plants. Uh, they, sometimes they'll leaf out earlier, they'll, they'll leaf out longer, they'll set seed uh, at out of sync times to the rest of the ecosystem, and they can, they can shade out development of native plants. Uh, they often require uh, more inputs, um, as, uh, grass being one of them, but that, that's not invasive. Um, and non-native plants have a 40 percent. I mean, they are four times more likely to become invasive. Um, it's also estimated that invasive plants cost the U.S. twenty dollars, twenty billion dollars annually to control, and one hundred twenty billion dollars in total costs. Um, Per the National Wildlife Federation, uh, it costs the economy billions by render, rendering rangelands unpalatable. That's clogging water pipes and decimating commercial fisheries by serving as um, transmitters of disease. Now, Maine has about 1,500 native species, 
And of all the species in Maine, so beyond that 1500, about a third are non-native, of which only a small fraction are invasive. That's a good thing because it doesn't take too many to cause uh, huge persistent problems. Um, and another word on invasive insects is, uh, as you might imagine, uh, there are invasive species of in insects too. Um, like plants in a different ecosystem, they can also proliferate and do uh, more damage than they might do in their native um, ecosystems. Uh, this is due to them not having the naturally evolved checks on them, the predators uh, for, for one. And going back to um, Vaughn Woods and the Eastern Hemlocks, uh, right now, and it's been, on, been this way for several years, uh, the Eastern Woolly Hemlock Adelgian has now taken hold in that area and threatens the lives of those hemlocks. And that's uh, also doing the same on uh, Garish Island and Kittery. So these are some plants to avoid. These are invasive species. And in Maine, as of 2017, there were 33 terrestrial plants that are, are not allowed to be sold, of which 19 are shown here. This list is reviewed approximately every five years, and the last review was recently uh, completed. The list now has uh, 30 more species, so it's up to uh, 63. Um, though there is a phase in period where the do not sell effective date is uh, January 1st, 2024. <clears throat> Gary Fish um, is the main state horticulturist. He recently gave um, a uh, presentation on invasive species, and there is a recording of it, and we'll try and find that. Um, he was previously on the Maine Board of Pesticide Control, and he was also instrumental in establishing the Maine Yardscaping and the uh, program and the two and a half acre Yardscaping Demonstration Garden in Portland, which alas is uh, not there, it's, there's construction going on around there. So we're going to look at a couple of invasives. And um, this is about a 40, 50 foot wide area in my yard, I call it my morass. And it's, uh, I was just talking to my, my wife about it. it was about two and a half years ago. Um, this is all bittersweet here and it's mixed with uh, multiflora rose and um, invasive honeysuckle. And uh, we just had at it. And uh, right now it's planted with some uh, no mow grass. It's uh, grass that doesn't require as much uh, care. We just mow it once a year and to keep uh, trees down. But um, these, this heart shape here is kind of mocking me. I certainly didn't love it, but uh, it needed to be done. And you may have seen these all over the place. And this is a close up of um, right nearby, a larger, uh, well, the, the previous um, bit of sweet vine is very, very small. It's probably, you know, a quarter of an inch in diameter. This one here is maybe an inch. And you can see, and I pulled it away from a tree, uh, an oak tree that it was girdling and I mean, uh, cutting into the oak tree was trying to grow around it. Um, the problem with, with these is these vines climb up a tree, they get larger and uh, they can bring down the tree as well as having all the leaves that shade out the canopy and uh, prevent the tree from growing. But uh, you can see the damage to what it does here. And this is a gentleman standing next to, actually it's a hemlock, I mean, a hemlock tree in Vaughn Woods. And he's put, got his hand around a huge uh, bittersweet vine that we were just kind of marveling at. Um, so here's an example of um, <clears throat> an invasive species on the left. That's uh, a burning bush. Um, very, very common. It was sold for a long time. It's uh, speaking of Vaughn Woods, the Hamilton house has some, they're nice looking hedgerows of uh, manicured uh, burning bush. Uh, but you, if you have it there, you will have it everywhere. And an alternative to a burning bush, which is a native, uh, is on the right is um, another vaccinium corymbosum. It's a high bush blueberry, and it provides a, um, a very, very similar um, beautiful red in the fall and naturally has the, the blueberries uh, that are edible. And another one is, I don't have a picture on it, is here is uh, a black chokeberry, Aronia melanocarpa similar red uh, colors and, and berries that are high in antioxidants. So um, enough of that, uh, an in-depth depth coverage of invasive plants is important, uh, but is sadly a presentation in itself. So let's move on to the next on the list of why natives and that sense of place. Um, <clears throat> the flora and the fauna that evolved in any given area around conditions such as geography, climate, geology, hydrology, uh, make up each uh, ecoregion's features. 
And those diverse interactions and adjustments over a long period of time, long, long period of time, um, impart those unique combination of features that characterize sense of place. And this is especially the case in Maine, as much of our economy was and still uh, very much is defined by its native natural resources. Um, those are um, <clears throat> made to fit. They're iconic and sometimes exclusively unique. Uh, if you think about puffins and pines and lobsters and blueberries are just a few of natives that, um, that say Maine. And another iconic popular place in Maine is the sunrise from uh, Cadillac Mountain. And there's something about a sunrise, right? Um, used to be awe-inspiring because it wasn't known why or how that fireball kept on coming up. But now we know so much more and it makes the phenomenon even more spectacular and appreciated. Um, um, so, uh, and, and they're, uh, they're beautiful. Uh, they have a purposeful beauty. They provide essential ecosystem services. They're not asking much. They're just to be what they evolved to be here. And they're part and parcel of uh, the natural world that they evolved in. And they've provided inspiration and materials for the built world and cultural artifacts through history. Uh, some examples are uh, being used as a uh, building materials. It's a red oak timber frame. Um, they provide materials and the red oak Quercus rubus supplies it being part of the, the Quercus uh, uh, genus supports 431 uh, insects and caterpillars. Uh, black cherry table here is uh, uh, Pinus serotina that supports 421. It's a beautiful wood to work with, uh, very, very durable. Uh, black ash basket used by native peoples uh, supports 127 uh, species. And uh, hard maple flooring, um, Acer saccharum supports 282 and um, naturally it gives us our, our maple syrup. So um, this has been primarily a why conversation um, with some house and uh, house and uh, which would be a uh, another pres presentation in itself, but we'll go over a couple of points because we're going to be talking about the um, pollinator friendly uh, garden certification. So for your pollinated garden, it's important to strive for continuous blooms um, through the spring, summer, and fall. Pollinators emerge at different times uh, throughout the year, and uh, they need. it's important to have a succession of nectar and poll pollen sources so that they'll have that supply they can access when they need it. Uh, plant a variety of different plants uh, for your own aesthetic explorations and for the diverse needs um, of the various pollinators and uh, uses of the plant material. Um, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, you want to plant densely in masses. They, they look better that way. And uh, insects uh, don't need to spend as much energy locating it or hopping from one plant to the next. Uh, vary the, the heights. We talked a little bit about layering. Uh, you, there are a lot of uh, native plants that tend to be kind of tall, but you can per perennial prune them. If you cut them about halfway up by the beginning to middle of June, They'll come back perhaps a little bit later, but they'll be shorter. And you can use that as a design feature to cut some of them and leave others, the ones in the back. Uh, you'll need to provide shelter for the pollinators, uh, provide a water source, and be sure to include caterpillar hosts. <clears throat> so um, it's important to remember that every garden counts, um, no matter how small it is. Uh, each one can uh, go towards that uh, 40, 20 million acres we're trying to chip away from the 40. And uh, also it's uh, consider growing from seed. It would help the, the biodiversity. It's fun, it's not very difficult. It does take a little bit of time, but um, uh, planting the seed, uh, usually it's planted in the fall or the winter and kind of um, knowing that something is growing and, and taking care of itself and it's going to help the, the ecosystem is very, very rewarding. And it's a great way to um, restore nature's balance. Wild Seed Project is a uh, great place, a great source for information and seed. So, <clears throat> see, it's, you know, about 10 minutes left here. Um, so the Pollinator Friendly Garden Certification Program um, is a four-step process. And the website's located there and um, Lori probably put it in the chat box, but it's, um, the website has a, a, a lot of tips, resources, and how to go about doing it. And it, it 
essentially goes through uh, what I just talked about. You want to provide food for pollinators, and uh, the website has lists to choose from and has space to add um, uh, other plants that might not be on the list, and it's continually being updated, so uh, other, other uh, plants are added. Nat natives are featured um, naturally, uh, <clears throat> but they don't all have to be natives, and uh, we don't want to get an ulcer trying to make sure that everything is, is, is native. Uh, but but uh, they're the ones that it's important to focus on. You'll need uh, three species in each of the three seasons. So you'll need a nine, at least nine plants uh, in order to be certified. And uh, I'll say here, uh, there's a, a place um, called Bagley Pond in Warner, New Hampshire. And uh, it, it's a nursery, uh, cellular plants. And um, there are several others that do this too. I think the National Wildlife Federation does it as well. And um, Prairie Moon Nursery in Minnesota, a little bit further away, uh, <clears throat> uh, has this too, but they put together kits that uh, will have three spring plants and three summer plants and three um, fall plants so that you kind of have a, a ready-made selection of plants to, to meet um, uh, your needs. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that they're broken down into um, sun and shade and uh, other um, uh, requirements, but uh, you can take a look at that. Uh, you'll next want to provide food for pollinators, a bird bath, a, a puddler, a bubbler, a river stream, or a pond are, are preferable. You need to provide shelter for the pollinators, and there are suggestions and tips on doing that, um, things like leaving the leaves and stems so that um, the overwintering uh, insects will have a place to protect themselves. And uh, the fourth is safeguarding the pollinator habitat. There are three actions. Uh, the, you'll be asked to eliminate pesticide use in, in the area that you're going to, trying to certify. Uh, remove invasive plants uh, where you're wearing when you can uh, to help protect the native plant communities and um, use additional conservation practices, uh, some of which are in the yardscaping, uh, such as mowing high, if you even have a lawn now, uh, watering wisely, tolerating weeds. And uh, <clears throat> this is a, a map, I don't think, I think it needs to be updated showing the, the uh, sites in New Hampshire and Maine that have uh, been certified pollinated garden pollinator friendly, and that's growing all the time. We'll be meeting shortly to uh, look at another group. And so we're on to the um, South Berwick Library Native Plant Garden. Several years back, um, uh, I was talking with native plants um, uh, with David Ramsey, and uh, he's on the South Berwick Conservation Commission, and he put together a proposal to uh, develop a garden uh, for the library. We spoke with other interested folks and the Conservation Commission too. And uh, at the time, Karen Eager was the um, uh, director of the library and she uh, okayed it and we started proceeding forward. Now it's Lee Shaw supporting us and the library. And volunteers uh, have uh, started preparing the site uh, to receive native plants uh, based on the design shown here, which was generally, generously uh, provided by uh, Terrence Parker of Terra Firma Design in Portsmouth. And um, there's a sign that we're working on producing uh, uh, that I designed. It's, uh, it'll be going up in front of that garden. And it's uh, got photographs of uh, various uh, native uh, pollinator plants and uh, some of the insects uh, that frequent them. And these are all plants that will be uh, shown in that garden. And uh, I should say, uh, we're always looking for people that are interested in, in native plants and uh, uh, we'll ask you to uh, um, contact the Conservation Commission or the library if you're interested in, in helping out with this project. Okay, so our resources is a uh, very long list. Um, it's too small to read on the screen unless you can zoom in on it. Um, so this is actually kind of works out because this I also have this as a PDF document that uh, can be emailed to you since you registered um, for this program. And it'll have the advantage of uh, having live links uh, so that uh, you don't have to type it in or um, it, it, they may or may not be on this list. Lori is uh, phenomenal at putting everything on it, so maybe they are, are already there. And if you don't know, um, you can save the chat. And if you look at your, your chat box, there are three little dots, the ellipsis. And if you click on that, you'll 
um, it'll give you an opportunity to save that if you want to keep those. But we can also send you um, this resource list. And uh, I want to thank you. And the pollinators thank you as well. <laughs>